the last 50 years, you have to think, do I mean forward or backward? Job 8, 8 to 10 says, For inquire, please, of bygone ages, consider what the fathers have searched out. We are but of yesterday and know nothing. For our days on earth are a shadow. Will they not teach you and tell you, in other words, out of their understanding? That was Job's question. First, you've had love brought from two classes that we meet with, the Delaware Valley class. And uh, Aaron reminded me we have a new picture of two of our uh, people that are joined in by telephone conference or not in here. He's got a new picture of that, but I wanted you to see us. And you've heard a lot about the Phoenix class. And uh, you can see this is even without everybody there. But uh, everything is great. And you'll see in the front one of our candidates that was just immersed. So we again bring love from there. Brethren, this is not a chronological prediction. Well, there will be a little bit of chronology in here. Well, that's not a prediction. I love the idea of watching the, don't you love the idea of the clock? atomic clock moving forward. But I'm going to look at five key developments that have come out of 50 years ago, 1967. I'm going to examine the impact that those have had on the projections or on the harvest expectations. And then we're going to look at some future expectations. One of I wanted to throw this in here because it's kind of a non-event, but I just found it was really interesting when you think about it. Uh, the world's changed a lot since 1967. This is a 1967 Corvette L88. Now, there were only 21 of those produced, and think about it. Price in 1967 was uh, 37500 one of the big events in Phoenix area while we're there is always the Barrett Jackson car auction. Well, in 2014, this car at the Barrett Jackson uh, auction went for three and a half million. So it just shows you, you know, who, who would have projected that in 1967? Probably no one. And that's the issue we always have. We don't always see everything enough to know how God works. If you were in an airplane and you watched two cars coming from opposite sides, you could see that those cars are going to hit and there's no escaping. But if you're one of the, on the road in one of those cars, you can't see that other car. That's really God's viewpoint. God sees both sides. God knows, it says, the end from the beginning. So while we may get impatient and wonder why things take so long, we have to realize God looks at it from an entirely different perspective. The first event I want to talk about is space exploration. January 27th, very beginning of 1967, you remember we were in the throes of the space program, Gus Grissom, Edward White, Roger Chaffee, uh, died on the launch pad. Remember there was a fire the rocket, and they died. And it set back the space program for a bit. But out of that, from that time forward, made some huge accomplishments in the space program. 69, we had the first lunar landing. Aaron told me that was a false picture, by the way. There are some who say that never happened. But 1975, we got the first photos from another planet from the planet Venus. And of course, 1990, the launch of the Hubble telescope made a huge difference in the way we looked at the world and the way we looked at our universe. 2011, we achieved the first orbit of Mercury. Some amazing things that happened just in that 50 year period. And just this last year, who would have thought two astronauts one American, one Russian, could spend a year in space and return safely to Earth. The reason I show that is because none of us probably in 67 would have seen that or only the visionary scientists would have said and 
we would have said, wow, that's pretty far out. But let's look at how that's impacted the harvest. This scripture, Psalm 115, 16, was a big quoted scripture in the days of the early explorations of space. The heaven, even the heavens are the Lord's, but the earth hath he given to the children of man. And it was a contention by many brethren that man could never escape the throes of earth. That's where his confinement was. In fact, one of the mentors that I had made this statement to me in 1967. If man lands on the moon, I will stop reading my Bible. Well, in 69, when man landed on the moon, of course, my mother, she was a lot, she was very outspoken. Those that know, she went to the person and said, after that happened, she said, well, are you going to stop reading your Bible? <laughs> of course, very difficult for us to see what the Lord has in mind. So it altered our expectations from that point on. How much will God let man accomplish? And I think one of the great things it's done, we can see it in our own movement, in our own changes, it has reached across the wealths of science to bring the concept of intelligent design, even those who are not Bible students. If you've never seen a movie made for lay people, uh, there's a movie called The Privileged Planet. And it shows the uniqueness of our planet within the universe. But this whole push towards intelligent design has come out of that space program and it's opened up a whole new realm of even witnessing and opportunities for us. So there's been a significant change in the way we look at man's accomplishments. At that point, we thought it might have only been another 13 years till the end of the harvest period. So the limits have expanded as to what we expected not what God said or determined. The second event, let's look at the civil rights movement. In 1967, Martin Luther King gave a famous speech called Beyond Vietnam. And in it, he called for the defeat of space, or a defeat of racism, materialism, and militarism. Martin Luther King achieved a lot in promoting race relations and race rights. And of course, in 68, the very next year, Lyndon Johnson, the President of the United States, signed the Civil Rights Act that made huge accomplishments and legal means to force equal rights among all races. What did that lead to? It led to a proclamation around the world of rights. It led to movements throughout Europe. And it ended up in 1991 when the USSR dissolved. And then a leading cry for rights as communism fell. And we saw it permeate across China, across Asia, across all areas of the then civilized world. And just recently, between 2003 and 2015, we've gone to the far end of the spectrum. And now 23 countries in our uh, world allow same-sex marriage as part of a right. Interesting that at one time, and amongst the brethren, we talked about rights being part of the proclamation and part of the uh, movement as we approach farther and farther along the harvest period. And those rights sometimes were real, like the civil rights movement. Man should not be based upon color, race, religion, but also imagined rights came out of that. The civil rights movement was really a noble movement, and it accomplished great things in our country and elsewhere. But also something happened out of that. Something happened that led us into a scripture in Joel as we saw the streams building in a harvest period. Joel 2, 2 and 11 read, A day of darkness, a day of gloominess, a day of clouds, a day of thick darkness as the morning spread upon the mountains, 
a great people and a strong. There hath never been ever the like, neither shall be any more after it, even to the years of many generations, and the Lord shall utter his voice before his army. The term, the Lord's great army, we know made up, those Lord's great army made up of those that were crying for freedom. Here's a quote that we find in volume four, the Battle of Armageddon. The Lord's great army developed slowly. And he says, uh, Brother Russell there says, not, it's not an undisciplined mob, but it is of a mighty host under a high degree of discipline. Almost all the contestants gird on the armor for personal and selfish interests. Brethren, there have been some really noble rights, but think about the selfish rights that have come for every kind of recognition. Many cases now we're moving into the whole area of gender and whether there really should be a gender or not proclaimed. Well, we can see what was called rights and imagined rights have come out of what sprung early on as that civil rights movement. The number three, technology. <laughs> sort of funny, back in 1967, you can see here uh, this picture of a Japanese executive, and there's a new video telephone in his office. It was a multi-channel phone, but it could communicate one way. $1,300 set up by Nippon Electric, and that was happened in 1967. Hey, we can now not just call up somebody on the phone. We can have a video conference. That was 1967, 50 years ago. 1982, what happened? We had the Internet Protocol Suite. I'm not a computer guy, but those of you who know, uh, who are, know that that was really the first sign that there was going to be broad-based use of something called an Internet. At first, it was used by the military, and eventually it would be uh, brought to the people. And especially we had this person, oh, Al Gore. Remember when he said he invented the Internet? Well, it's not exactly true. As we know, he sort of paid for that in the presidential campaign. But he did do something that created a miraculous event. And that's the 1993 legislation passed that would create the information superhighway. We had this panel this morning and, and telling you all the dangers that have come out of that. And that's exactly one of the things as we look at it, what happens with some of these things is even though we gain this technology, there are things that happen that we didn't bargain for. It's that old adage about be careful what you wish for because you may get it. But undoubtedly there was one event during this 50-year period that changed the world of technology. Anyone know who this is? Right, Steve Jobs. And what's he holding in his hand? Now, I know some of you are sitting there with your iPhone on your lap, and it's covered up, and you're sort of checking on things. All right, but you have it on silent, and so I'm not going to gripe about that. But let's think about what this has created. That was 10 years ago. 2007, Jobs introduces the Apple iPhone. That iPhone is more powerful than those computers used in that early space technology and space exploration that I talked about, the Apollo landings. That was pretty powerful. Well, what has that created? I think one of the things that's happened is the promotion of the concept of uncovering the things and the sins of the earth. Let's look at 2 Peter 3.10. Now, we've had this quoted several times, and I realized uh, it wasn't quoted this way. I want to look at it from the revised version, improved and corrected, and I've talked to you about that. But here's the concept, because it presents the right concept behind this scripture. The day of the Lord will have come as a thief, in the which the heavens shall pass away, with a great noise, and the elements shall be dissolved with fervent heat, and the works that are therein shall be burnt up. 
No. Notice the correct idea, the correct translation as they will be exposed or discovered. Uh, here again, we have a fault of the translators and not using the concept. Well, what has happened in the last 50 years? Throughout history, individuals, governments, whether it's dictators or governments, how have they held on to the power and kept the people from understanding? We heard the message about Martin Luther and what he brought to the people. They control the dissemination of information and ideas. That's why we're in such a havoc today because nobody can control what the president or anyone else says because they can go directly to the people. And that's the, in, that's the power. A single person with the technology you have in your pocket, in your briefcase, in your lap. You can compress what used to take days Weeks into seconds. What does that mean? It means never again, never again can people be completely silenced. Think about that. You can transmit, we've seen it across the universe from people recording things and promulgating them on the internet to being able to stand in Tiananmen Square. And broadcast. Brethren, it's been a huge impact. How has this impacted the harvest? And what we expect? Let's look at how that benefits. What has come out of there. And how the Lord has used this technology to promote his cause. Even though we have these sidesteps where it's used in an undesirable manner. 2016 International Convention Baptism, 2014 Baptism. We had brethren coming from all different countries who were able to grasp the truth through the use of the Internet and find it. And as a result of that, they were able to, to latch on to the Bible students and the movement and the truth and resulting in being able to understand the Lord's call from no matter where they were in the world. We attended the Keep Foray Convention in 2014. We can broadcast a convention like this one anywhere in the world today. Brethren can have an attachment and get that information. Think about what has been accomplished by the use of email and the old Ron list that we have. We can reach brethren wherever they are, whatever we want. Brethren, in the last two years... We've had baptisms at this convention. You'll recognize here uh, Andre and Simone, who were immersed last year, Jacqueline Fowler, uh, Sharon Feifeld, all coming out of the Jehovah Witness movement because they've been able to discover through the Internet sites and the webs, they've been able to discover the real truth, not what they've been told by those who want to capture and hold them because they control the information. Not controlling the information, I think, is a huge accomplishment in moving forward from both a prophetic standpoint of contributing towards those uh, that time of the end as far as the world goes, but also the Lord accomplishing His task. Think about Africa and other places opening up now. Number four event is war. 1967, we were right in the middle of Vietnam. And as a result of that, I think there are a lot of things that changed and the whole attitudes around the world towards war. Unfortunately, this is one I have to X out because of time. Perhaps in another time we can discuss the impact this has made on the attitudes and accomplishments uh, since 1967. But I've got to move on to the number five event. And of course, that event, Israel. Fifty years ago, 1967, Israel went through a six-day war. That war in 1967 would lead to a transformation of the entire Middle East, and I would propose even all of religion. 
Everything had been virtually untouched until that point. But remember what happened in 67. You had this huge buildup of Arab forces around Israel, along the borders. Israel knew what was going on through their intelligence, launched this attacks against both Egypt on the south, against Syria. Uh, Jordan attacked, but they could not stand up against Israel's proficient forces. There was a ceasefire declared six days later after that June 5th. In 1967, the United Nations declared a ceasefire or negotiated a ceasefire. As a result of that, Israel more than doubled its size. But significantly, they claimed, reclaimed the old city of Jerusalem. And you remember this famous picture of the three soldiers, paratroopers, standing by the wall. Earlier in June, when we had this event, those three were reunited, and a picture was taken with them standing beside the wall. But many wept at that event because it was something that was to transpose and transpire in Israel. After the 67 war, Israel incorporated both what you see in the light yellow and kind of the light tan. But as you know, after 19, in 1979, they returned the Sinai to Egypt. Uh, later, 1981, the annexation that was tried of the Golan Heights has not been internationally recognized. Israel, you see, still defends that Golan Heights, but it's not recognized as part of Israel. And 1993, Israel surrendered governmental control to the Palestinian Authority of the Gaza Strip, took out its soldiers and, and the settlers that were there in 2005, still battling over that issue. But you can see that stirred up quite a bit, that 67, to now begin a whole new process. They signed a peace pact with Jordan in 1994 to alter the view of having to defend the West Bank. But there was a huge impact on the Arab world as a result of this 67 war. Why? Because the old Arab world coming out of the 40s, you can read, if you want to read a book, Arab Nationalism talked about this nationalistic view of Arabs out of the 1940s, now, because of the failure to take out Israel in 67, we had the rise of political Islam, the rise of terrorist extremism, growing, growing, until now it's plaguing the world on both a group and an individual basis. So 1991, out of that, what happened? Iraq invades Kuwait and the Gulf War began. I remember we were going in for pizza in uh, Langhorn, Pennsylvania, where the kids live, Rachel and Aaron live, and we saw the attack first going on in 1991. 2001, despite what many believe, there was a terrorist attack on America. Planes hit the World Trade Center, and as a result, we invaded Afghanistan, changed the whole profile of that part of the Middle East. 2001, Al-Qaeda is established in Iraq to try to set up a caliphate. And of course, 2006, the Islamic State is established and in 2013, rebranded as ISIS, the Islamic State, wanting to set up again entire Middle East. What happens with them, we don't know, but certainly they've been fighting since. That's the Arab world. But Israel was hugely transformed itself after that 67 war. This is Theodore Herzl. You remember one of the, the early promulgator of settling in Israel. When Herzl was setting up that concept of Israel and a return to the land, it was a secular society. Jews had been huh, captured across the world and lost much of their religious faith. It was a militant group. It was an atheistic group. And the Jews of faith at that time rejected Zionism for that reason. They were waiting for God to redeem them. 
they did not realize that maybe this was how God was redeeming them. It's about that old adage of the man sitting on the rooftop in a flood and waiting for God to save him, not knowing that the boat and the others that came by were there to do it. But think about how God works. It doesn't always work the way you or I would do and deliver me. He works through, through sometimes small things. Religious Zionism remained very marginal and it remained very weak in Judaism at the time when we had the founding of Israel. But the 67 war changed that. It changed Judeus Zionism. Israel, after the 67 war, gained confidence. Their fear of annihilation changed to euphoria as they beat these enemies in an astounding victory. They gained that Golan Heights. They gained Sinai, which we said was later returned. But the Temple Mount, East Jerusalem, the Zion of Zionism, and Judea, that ancient homeland of the Judeans of Jesus' day. Religious Zionism and the movement of settlers now to Israel became the dominant form of Israeli Judaism. This is a picture of the beach in Tel Aviv. And many have said that Tel Aviv is the sin city capital of the world. But let's look at what's happening even there. 67 ushered in this religious revival. And suddenly, those that were secular Jews started learning about the religious faith. Those that returned from places like Russia that had no belief in God started to learn about the God of Abraham. Messianic religious Zionism gradually is gradually now displacing the secular Zionism that we saw in the founding of Israel. That ideological force in Israel is beginning to penetrate, and it's even penetrating Tel Aviv. This picture on the Tel Aviv beach is a reading of Lamentations chapter 1 as many Israelis start to try to bring faith into that country. Well, here's the chronological part I promised to you. Is 1967 a biblical date? And I've mentioned it for Israel because Israel is God's time clock. I think we all agree since that founding It's a very good way to judge what's going on. The kids in the 11 to 13 group this week have been studying Daniel. And if I had them over here, I could ask them. They would know the answer about the 2300 days of Daniel 8. But Daniel in Daniel 8 questions, how long is it going to be before the holy place that was transgressed will be back in the hands of Israel? And the answer he got from the angel was for 2,300 evenings and mornings. Then the holy place will be properly restored. Now those of you who are students of the second volume and the chronology there will recognize that that's the chronology that's used in connection with the cleansing of the sanctuary, the spiritual sanctuary that ends up in 1846 based on 454 B.C., which Brother Russell subscribes as the as the proclamation to return to Israel. And that, I'm not negating that idea, but as in so many cases, maybe we have more than just a spiritual application of the 2300 days. Why do I say that? You read Daniel 8, it never tells you where to start counting. We know in Daniel 12, when we have the 1260, the 1290, 1335, we know where to start that. But we're never told in Daniel 8 where to start the 2300 days. When the sanctuary of Israel was physically assaulted and destroyed by Antiochus Epiphanes, he desecrated that temple and replaced it with idol worship. It was in 334 B.C., a well-documented date. If we take 2300 years from 334 B.C., Remember, we've got to compensate for the year zero, which there is none. It comes to that date, 1967 A.D. I would submit 
that this is perhaps the Lord's time clock to understand why 67 was such a pivotal date in Israel's history and shows us that we are exactly on the right time. The vision that we have is not tearing. It is moving just exactly as God plans. So where does this leave Israel today? Isaiah 11, 11 and 12 says that the Lord would recover the people of Israel the second time. Now that's interesting, isn't it? Because we know that first disbursement, when they went into Babylon, you know, they, were, they were destroyed. Many would say, well, you know, that was their destruction. But notice he says, I will bring them out the second time. Those that would come out, he says, from Assyria, Egypt, Pathrath, Cush, the whole world at that point from the islands of the sea. Jeremiah even puts it this way. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, in Jeremiah 23, 7, they shall no more say, the Lord liveth, which brought up the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. But the Lord liveth, which brought up and which led the seed of the house of Israel out of the north country, and from all countries whither I had driven them. Our day, and especially since 1967, has seen a bigger migration than came out of Egypt, which was probably about 2 million people. Let's look at where we are today. 2006, 40 years roughly, after that war, Israel reached a milestone. What was that milestone? Before the Holocaust, or after the Holocaust, there were only two main centers left for Jewish life. One was America, one was Israel. 1990, the Jewish population in the U.S. was 5.5 million. And in in the year 2000, it had shrunk to 5.2 million. Israel's Jewish population passed 5.6 million in 2006. Think about it, brethren. For the first time since A.D. 135, there are more Jews in Israel than in any other single country. It is estimated, by the way, that if there weren't a Holocaust, there might have been as many as 26 million Jews. Today we're seeing a rise in the number of Jews leaving Western Europe for Israel. Why? The Jewish policy research looked at six countries that you see circled here. You can't see the United Kingdom, Germany, Belgium, France, Spain, and Italy. Those six countries account for 70% of the Jews in Europe. There's still not an exodus from those countries, but notice this quote. It is clear that Jews in part of Europe are genuinely concerned about their future. Most likely because of anti-Semitism. The bias against Israel is now so open that even the UN recognizes it. Outgoing Secretary General Ban Ki-moon said this, decades of political maneuverings have created a disproportionate volume of resolutions, reports, and conferences criticizing Israel. We must never accept bias against Israel within UN bodies. Well, it's a lot of talk. Unfortunately, you never walk the walk. But it does show you what had happened because what happened, almost half of the UN Human Rights Council has centered on condemning Israel for a gross violation of human rights, war, and atrocities all being ignored in places like Syria. And during his term, 223 resolutions were introduced condemning Israel, only eight condemning Syria. Now, anyone doesn't have to be an expert to know that there's something out of proportion there. Zechariah 12.3 from the Darby translation says, I will make Jerusalem a burdensome stone unto all peoples. We heard this scripture earlier this week. All nations of the earth shall be assembled together against it. And Jeremiah 30 is that quote that says, All thy lovers have forgotten me. They seek thee not. This scripture is generally applied to our day, although some would apply it to earlier periods. But there's no question 
at Jerusalem, and the question of Israel has become a major complex. Well, we have just a few minutes left. So let's move to future expectations. The future of Israel, I think, is tied to Armageddon. We all know that. And I want to, as I present this part of it, I just want to acknowledge that I've spent a lot of time talking with Brother Ken Rawson about this, and I've appreciated his perspective, some of these, and some of the thoughts come out of our conversations. But this is what we should expect as we see beyond 67, beyond 2017, 50 years later. There could be a temporary peace in Israel. Jeremiah 6.14 and 8.11 both tell us that. I think there will be one final Israeli-Arab war that will gain for them Jordan, parts of Lebanon, Syria. Isaiah 11.14 and Zephaniah 2.2-10 2, 2 give us that kind of information. And then I think there will be a huge immigration from the West that we haven't seen because of those countries that I mentioned. No mass exodus. Zechariah 10.10 10 and Isaiah 11.15-16 and 16 indicate that we will see that emigration. And I've said here in connection with the sixth plague, I think, which is the drying up of the river Euphrates. And then a period when there are no threats. The period of unwalled villages. Unwalled villages has been a, a real contention as to what exactly that means in Ezekiel 38.11. But think of it this way. Today, there are two truisms in Israel. The first truism is if the Arabs and other nations, ISIS, whatever, put down their weapons, there would be no more war in Israel. If Israel put down its weapons, can you complete the sentence? There would be no more Israel. That's where we are today. Somewhere in the future, I believe there will come a time when there are no threats against Israel. Why? It remains to be unseen. And then we have the invasion of Gog and others in Ezekiel 38 and 39. And Ezekiel 20, 38 indicates a purging of those that are not religious, those that are the true secular Jews that I talked about at the beginning, pre-1967 and that period of the founding. And then we know in Zechariah 12, 8 to 14, God fights for Israel and turns that nation to Messiah, the last step before the inauguration of the kingdom. Well, brethren, what does that mean? What does all this mean for us? In Habakkuk 2.2, Habakkuk is told to write the vision and make it plain on tables. We have that scripture on all of our chart of the ages. And the famous quote in there is that part, the vision is yet for the appointed time. It hasteth toward the end. This translation says, it shall not lie. Our King James says, it shall not tarry. That is not the correct thought. It shall not lie. It shall tell us what will happen. It will surely come. It will not delay. Habakkuk had asked God two things. One, why do you wait so long to deal with the evil that exists in Judah? It was at the time right before Judah was uh, to be taken captive in Babylon. And then when God said, well, I'm going to deal with them. I'm going to let Babylon come in and take them away. And he says, oh my gosh, how can you use worse sinners to punish your people? And God answers saying, well, don't worry, I'm going to punish those evildoers, but the faithful will be rewarded. Brother Nat captures God's view. He's using these things around us. God is using, as we lament, why do you delay, Lord? Why does it take so long for us to be delivered? Have we missed something? No, God answers in Joel 2, 2 to 11. I'm dealing with this through the actions of the Lord's great army. This selfish and unrighteous group that rises slowly up to deal with sin, and whether it's on the left or the right, to bring those conditions down to the point where we can be accomplished. So God told Habakkuk to write that vision because he would understand then God's work. Brethren, we have the writings. We have the understanding. We know what to expect in the plan. We need to find peace in seeing that the world is work, working a 
exactly according to that plan. Hopefully, we find comfort in that knowledge. The sovereignty of God is behind all this. And just as Daniel endured in Daniel 12.4 by remembering what God said, witness how I've accomplished these things. And hopefully 1967 contemplations give us that understanding of taking us where we need to be in that understanding. So we should be comforted in this and understand God has not delayed anything. We are expecting things to continue according to his plan. It's up to us to delve that plan and understand it. Make sure we align our own expectations with his. And realize that God is going to protect you as one of his children, no matter what is occurring around you. A little while, he that cometh shall have come. He shall not tarry. My righteous one shall live by faith. To God be the glory forever and ever. Thank you.